Uh, Minister Birmingham just mentioned that um, the pandemic is not of our own making, but one of the things that is up to us is local transmission. And one of the drivers of the current outbreak in Australia seems to be uh, that a lot of people are not really taking the situation very seriously or as seriously as, as they should, getting fairly lax in the way we follow or the way we enforce uh, the public health guidelines. Given that we have a national emergency, a national public health emergency, should there be a framework of civil or even criminal liability uh, for undermining public health orders or for inciting people to ignore instructions related to uh, the national health emergency? Bill Bertel. Uh, I think I learnt in the days of HIV and AIDS that uh, while it's very tempting to come down with the full force of the law to try to moderate people's behaviour, uh, it's pretty counterproductive. Uh, in those days, we had to persuade people to change their behaviours and sustain behaviour. And in relation to HIV, if, say, with sex, that meant at two o'clock in the morning there was not going to be a policeman uh, moderating uh, the decision between two people about whether to use a condom. Now, we're faced with much the same problem here, that we have to persuade people to change behaviours, and some people are resistant to that. Uh, but they have to be persuaded, they have to be brought into it, and they have to understand on their own behalf why they're doing this and why it's in their interests and the community's interests. So... While I appreciate uh, what the question is trying to say there, I think there's got to be a social pressure mm. that falls behind the behavioural changes we need. But, George, you're seeing it there in Melbourne. Obviously, people adapting very quickly to the masks, but people also reacting to it, you know, storming into a Bunnings, for example, or, you know, filming yeah, themselves so. at a border check. This sort of stuff, when people are making huge sacrifices themselves, uh, is horrifying to many people, isn't it? Well, Hamish, can I go with a vibe on this thing? Uh, Victorians were all in for lockdown for about six or seven weeks and then they started making their own rules. Uh, they were sort of detecting loopholes. They sensed that the political class was uh, about to declare mission accomplished. Mm. And I know it became very difficult towards the end of that first phase of the lock-up. And, in fact, I know Dan Andrews, when he did uh, lift the restrictions, they'd, we'd, they'd, we'd sort of already lifted them off ourselves. That was, that was phase one. Phase two, this one's been much more uh, problematic, I think, for the government, partly because, you know, right up front, let's acknowledge the blunder in the hotel quarantine. So the virus got out. Now let's acknowledge the responsibility at both the federal and the state level, especially at the federal level on uh, aged care and also the industrial relations framework that, that sends people to work when they've got symptoms. So these are, these are, these are big issues. But there's one thing, and I want to draw back and, and maybe play the journal and throw a question back to Bill, if I could. Go for it. One thing that, one thing that seemed to be missing at the start of this um, was that the Victorian government, and this is the government you would have assumed would have got this uh, more right than any other state government because it was socially progressive, it identified with multicultural communities, it identified with vulnerable communities. But the messaging uh, about, uh, you know, wash your hands, maintain social distance, and, if you've, and if, you've, if you've got a dry cough, go and get tested, that message was very top-down. It almost assumed that if you had to be tuned into uh, ABC 24 every day to see the Premier and the Chief Medical Officer deliver that message. Now, there are a number of communities didn't hear that at a peer-to-peer -peer level, the way I think the AIDS campaign was. You need to hear these things from a, someone in your own community that you can trust. Now, we'll give you a counterfactual. Okay, uh, just, just on that, uh, George, before Bushel, we... I'll just give you a very quick counterfactual. Basha Hawley, uh, Richmond footballer, unfortunately his mum got sick and she's not well. The little message he gave to his community uh, to get tested, that had, and the club has now got some media monitoring done on it, up to 24 million, up to 24 million media users were in a position to see that thing on internet, print, uh, uh, radio, and to hear it on radio and in TV. When you, when you, when you localise the message, when you get mm -hmm. down at a community level and tell the community on its terms... Uh, what you need to do. I think you get much better outcomes than the things we've seen. Now, and can I just, say, just granted, we've made, granted we've made some mistakes, George, but we need to the, learn from these this mistakes. Is, this is a theme that we have heard over and over again from community organisations and community partners, that we really need to learn from the very best of what Australia did in responding to the HIV AIDS yeah. crisis, which was about putting front and centre the groups who have most at risk to help lead the uh, communication, the planning, not 
a top-down approach, to have that as a genuine partnership with those community... Community leaders are really wanting to be a part of the solutions. Uh, I need and, to and bring it's Karen been patchy to... about to what extent... Even on the basic communication sure. plans, we've had that kind of replicated this time around. It's been much more top-down and many people have been excluded from it and trust is really key. I need to bring Karen Sui in on this because you've got some strong views about the way this has been handled but also the way stigmatisation has impacted certain communities. Uh, yeah, look, I think the pandemic... Um, like, there's obviously been... Um, we talk about multicultural communities. Obviously, there has been a surge in racism. Uh, and what we've found is, um, I mean, in the US it's ten times. Uh, for American Asians it's, it's increased by ten times. And I think in Australia it's about 30% increased in um, particularly targeting um, Australians of Asian descent. But I think the challenge with the pandemic is, is that um, it's an incredibly emotionally charged time. Um, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of uncertainty. But, it, you know, what we are seeing, however, is individuals walking into shops or graffiti on their houses because they are Australian and they are of Asian descent. And we're seeing, I think what we're saying well, here is... What's some of the stuff you've seen? Because you've shared it with us. I mean, it's extraordinary. I'm hearing and I'm, you know, there's a lot of racism forums going on at the moment. Um, again, everybody... Like, there's a lot going on in society. We're just saying this particular... Um, the conf I think... What's happening is we've got politics, geopolitics is going on. We've got a place which represents, is the multicultural centre of Australia, Chinatown, uh, which has been incredibly affected because I think people then have associated a place with a pandemic. And in, ad in addition to that, you've then got individual people of Asian descent being targeted in, a, like, just in the streets or in the shops. And so people are associating a pandemic with a place and with a person. And so we've almost got... Um, a very heightened, emotionally charged period that, that really should be bringing people together, having a sense of social wellbeing and care. But, look, I, I mean, mental health is also an issue that's associated. So, yeah, there's and a lot there's going on. A, there's been a lot of um, advocacy to try and get an anti-racism strategy in place from the very beginning, well before this anyway. Yes. These are moments when these issues flare in come communities up. and we can either become more and more divided or we actually can really take this very seriously, that we've got choices about which futures we set off on here. Um, and, I, you know, I was really struck by that question by the young people as well. You know, the sense of somehow we're pitching young people against older people. Um, and it will be through bringing young people into the discussions, making sure that they see the facts as well. They are grappling with these big debates too. You know, if we were going to do something... Because we can succeed with this. I've got no doubt about it. We've got every resource available to us to do it. We're a very privileged country in that way. If we could deliver a greener future, a more secure future, with the right sort of social protection so young people knew right. they'd have a place to live, they would be guaranteed of a job, that's the kind of thing that would m motivate rather than what is often very bereft discussions about debt and deficit, as you know. Well.